Welcome to the Indigenous episode of The Litmus Test. This is Tina A. Wake. I'm here today at NASDA with beautiful choreographer and dancer, Raymond Blanco. So what is your heritage? Um, I'm Pajika Wick on my Aboriginal side, um, which is right at the tip of Cape York, up near Bamaga and Ingenue there. Um, that's where the Aboriginal side of the family comes from, and that's through my father's side. As well from my father's side, I'm, I'm Magarem from Murray Island, Mayor. And on my mother's side, I'm Darnley Island, Erub, and Malay. Wow. Yeah, so it's all a bit of a, a fruit salad. A fruit salad. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. With beautiful black curly hair, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> what drew you into dance? Ah, oh, hard to say really. I, I, you know, you just know. You just know when, like I, I remember when I got kicked out of high school, I, um, I, I think I had about 15 jobs in six months. And I just kept popping around, going from one to the other. One of the, the classic ones was I went for a, an apprenticeship as a painter. And the guy says, so you like, why do you, why do you want this job? And I said, because I like to paint. <laughs> Not necessarily houses, but you know. <laughs> uh, and so then I realised, hang on, maybe there's something about the arts or something. And then like all through my youth, I was, I was just dancing and family gatherings and everything. And where was Raymond? He was dancing. Um, so yeah, it sort of was a natural avenue. As soon as I heard that um, Sylvia, my cousin, Sylvia Blanco, was dancing in Sydney, I, well, that was it, I was going to Sydney. There was no question about it. Did she help you figure out what to study or where to go or who to meet? Well, she was already at NASDA. Uh, she was the second or the, th the second group of students that came through NASDA and um, she had to convince my grandmother to allow me to go. And my grandmother said he can't do anything until 18. When he turns 18, he can do what he wants. <clears throat> and so I turned 18 and two weeks later I was on a plane to Sydney. Right. Yeah. So and where were you at the time in Queensland? In Innisfail, yeah, yeah. in Queensland, yeah. Right. That's well, pretty much where I grew up and in Innisfail. Although I was born in Townsville, um, the family moved up to Innisfail where my grandmother um, brought us up after my mother passed. Right. Yeah. So, and so yeah. you were studying at NASA at 19, in 1980, is that right? 1980. Yeah, I, um, I did a workshop with them in 79 and then that, that sealed the deal pretty much and um, apparently I was supposed to audition to come down but I just said I'm coming down. <laughs> well and, they said yes. And they said yeah and they picked me up and that was it. I haven't looked back since. So <laughs> Probably really... less paperwork than now I suppose. Well yeah from now, now, now it's a totally different kettle of fish here. Yeah. You know, it's, the, the evolution of NASDA from the late 70s, early 80s to now is just incredible, you know, 39 years later and when, well, we're not only running the place, we're sort of setting the standard for where Aboriginal dance is going, you know, it's, it's just an amazing organisation to be, to be involved with. Yeah. yeah. And so after your studies, what did you do? Oh, <laughs> um, well, I did a lot of commercial work. I, I guess in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, there was you wouldn't see a lot of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander dancers in the mainstream. Uh, so you would always get cast in the Aboriginal or the creative native or the, this or that. So I decided to go um, into the commercial world. So I worked with um, Tony Bartuccio dancers and did the Ray Martin show. And, and then I, I worked with the Australian Opera Ballet and I got a couple of solo gigs with them, a few operas, and then I had, did the ABC television Dancing Days, it was a, before Dance Academy, um, back in the 80s with Meryl Tankard. And um, yeah, I sort of did all of that sort of stuff and it sort of set me up with a, a broad sense of what dance was about. about. Um, and then I came back to NASDA and um, started with the Aboriginal Ab Dance Theatre as a dancer. And what about theatre as well? You're in theatre yeah, and did, did a bit of acting and... I did acting, I did modelling, I did all of that. I mean, like, it was pretty much... NASA opened the doors. You know, you came here thinking, I'm going to be a dancer. But then there was like, well, actually, I can do that. I can do this as well. And, and every, there was a stage where I thought, I'm going to stop dancing and I'm going to be an actor. And then every role I got, the producers and the directors would say, oh could you choreograph a little bit of a dance in this scene? And I was like, or can you interpret this scene with no words? And it was like, oh, here we go. So it was something that you could never escape. You know, right. once people knew you were a dancer, that was it. Yeah. And so from life. dancing led to choreography? 
yeah, that was interesting. Um, especially when you're working with choreographers who um, had a way of working. They'd have a picture in their head and you had to fit that picture. And sometimes I didn't want to fit that picture. I wanted to interpret that picture. So I decided that my stories were better to be told <laughs> by me than me trying to tell someone else's story, you know. Uh, so that led me into choreography. My first piece of choreography was done as part of NASTA. Um, yeah, and it was called Prison. About the, back in the 80s, there was a lot of um, prison deaths, by um, suicide or whatever it was, um, that led our young people to, um, to die in prisons. So um, sort of touched on that, and then that's it's like, oh my God, the, the, the reaction to something so potent at that time was really, I got, I got sucked in on it. It was like, yeah, I, can, I have something to say. I can say something worthwhile and people can relate to it, you know, so, yeah. No, that's really good. And it's taken you all around the world, your dancing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my fantasy now is to actually travel the world without a dance company. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just be a tourist, you mean? Yeah, just be a tourist, you know. Uh, well, as much as we've, we've done South America, we've done Europe, we've done America, we did every pretty, pretty much continent on, on, on the planet, um, you're always with your dance company and you're always off the plane, on a bus, to the hotel, to the theatre, back to the hotel, on the plane, back, or on to the next place you were going to. Um, and, and it went on for years and years and years and, and there was a year, I think it was about 1995, 96, where AIDT, the company, was the most toured dance company in Australia, where literally we would walk in the door of the office and they'd hand us our plane tickets and we'd walk back out and get, get, change suitcases and head off again, you know. It was really, really hectic, really, really busy. So how long straight did you do that? Um, well, I ran the Aboriginal Dance Theatre from 1989 to 1999, 2000. Yeah, so for 10 years we, we pretty much toured everywhere and did a, a lot of work. Sort of, I guess, sharing the load with Bangara. Um, there were no Aboriginal dance companies before us. Uh, and I guess Stephen and I, we had no artistic directors to sort of look to, to Aboriginal artistic directors to look to as um, dance leaders. So we had Brian Siren, of course, who was an actor. We've had um, Justine Saunders and all of those, Bob Mazza, who were all actors. But as far as dance was concerned, there was no sort of leader for us to follow. So we sort of had to work it out for ourselves. And, and now you're it. And now we're it. And there's this whole other generation of people coming up. That's just like, they all look to you and it's like really weird. You don't, you don't actually think about it until you've sort of someone says, oh, I saw blah, blah, and you think back. And then you think, wow, <laughs> I, you know, you have done a lot, you've achieved a lot, and you, it's nothing, you, you, you don't sort of rely on it, or just, it's just, it's just there, it's, it's part of Well, it's a given, because it's what yeah, it's you what, love. It's what it? you love, it's what you do. You, I mean, like, I, I couldn't do any, my life would be so different if I wasn't, Yeah. You know, doing what I do. If you stayed painting. <laughs> painting, <laughs> painting houses. Yeah. yeah. No, I, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. It's the same. It's the same. Like you know, when you get married and you have kids, you know, that would have been totally different. Yeah. Right. You, oh God, no! I've got forty kids here. That's sufficient. <laughs> Did anything funny happen while you were touring? Like fall off the stage or anything? I think. Oh no! Actually, no. One I can tell you. We. <laughs> Uh, we were on tour around Southeast Asia. We'd done Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan. We came back to Australia and we'd started at Cairns and we worked our way down the coast and we got to Townsville and everyone was really, really tired, really, really over it. And having done the same show for so long, we get to Townsville and we're rehearsing and one of our um, dancers had a turn, he was on medication and so he couldn't dance. So three hours before the opening, we had to re-rehearse the whole show without him in it. So we're doing it and there's a section where I'm doing a turn with a stick in the middle and one of the dancers decides they're gonna improvise as well. So it comes up out of their position while I'm spinning with the stick and I broke his nose. <laughs> as I'm spinning I'm, and I was going so fast and I looked up and he sort of, 
came up and looked at me and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to hit him. <laughs> and I was already coming and it was like whack, blood, everything everywhere. So we had to sort of not open at 8 o'clock, I had to open at 8.30 while he was getting fixed. His nose. It was hilarious, the poor guy, you know. He was hilarious like, for you. <laughs> It was hilarious for him too because he, he realised that he shouldn't have been doing, he should have stuck to the script, you know. <laughs> Don't move from your position. Don't move while, you know, while the king is in place. <laughs> Swinging a stick. Swinging a stick, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that was so much fun. We, we, I mean, like, the touring days, it, it was like a bonding of a family. Right. You know, it was very, all of the dancers that were in my dance company have gone on to amazing careers since. But they're just, uh, we, we don't see each other all the time, but when we do, it's just like family, family yeah. straight up. And how yeah. many people are in the group kind of thing? Uh, I think at the most we had about 10 or 11, mm -hmm. uh, but we did go through a few. Some sort of went off and did other things, but the mainstay, six, seven, eight. It was Dennis Newey, um, who's now called Dujon Newey. Um, <laughs> we had uh, Sydney Saltner, who now runs the Rekindling with Bangara. Uh, we had uh, Matthew Doyle, who now does a lot of cultural stuff with his people out of Campbelltown in Western, New South um, Western Sydney. Uh, we had Marilyn Miller, who is now a leader of dance in Queensland, uh, working with Kayaf, uh, the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair. We had uh, Cheryl Pitt, who's gone back to community and she started up stuff in um, Weeper. Um, Brian Munns. Bless his soul, he's um, passed away now, but he was also a mainstay. Lewis Lambton, who's also doing arts in Alice Springs as well. Wow. So yeah, there's quite a few of us and, and, and we'll always be tight. Yeah. We'll always be tight, yeah. Do you have reunions? They're all screaming for one now. Right. Because Nays' 40th is next year. Yeah. And so everyone's going, are we getting together? Because it, I guess over the time, since 99, 2000, when we broke the company up, um, well, that, what's that, 15 years now? Um, there's a whole two or three generations of people who don't really know about AIDT, the company. They think contemporary Aboriginal dance, Bangara, which is noticeable because, you know, they've had a, a, a long run. Um, and then when they actually realise the, the true history of Aboriginal dance in this country, they go, oh, oh, really? So then they go back and do their research and then all of this other stuff. So the dancers from AIDT are thinking it's time to actually get together and let people know what we spent 10, 10 years of our lives doing, you know. Um, and I think it's a great time. With a receptive audience that loved you, you know. Oh, that was, yeah. It was incredible. We had like sellout seasons. There was a season, uh, a tour of South America we did where we had to stay another a month because the, the, they'd sold extra tickets and we had to stay there and, and, continu yeah, and continue the, the tour. And go back and to, like go back to cities and then redo the same show again. And it was just like, oh my god! And the people just kept coming and coming and coming. And so, is it an interesting Australian Indigenous, or is it their connection to their Indigenous through you that brings the? It was that. It was that. I think they, for a lot of people, I feel that they felt Australia was a white country. Right. Um, not so much in Germany. In Germany, um, in Europe, they were really well educated about. The, the struggles of our people yeah. here. So that, that was, how are we re dealing with that now? And that's what we were doing through the dance. So they were really relating to that. In South America, definitely, yeah. definitely, because we looked local. And <laughs> seriously, in Brazil, they thought we were Brazilians. Right. We, had to, we had to actually have bodyguards with us everywhere we went because like, they think, because we were dark, but not too black, but you know, they, they, they didn't, couldn't quite place us. Right. And when we say Australia, they'd go, hang on, that's white, you know, wool, yeah. sort of thing. So they didn't know that history. So they gave us bodyguards to look after us in, in these places, you know. So it was very, very interesting to then have conversations with them and how they'd lost contact or how colonisation had affected their people, um, Taiwan, Japan, and, and incredibly so, because they'd moved all of their, the native Japanese people to the northern parts of Japan. and. You know, we had to ask to meet them. So they, they bust them in to meet us. It was bizarre. It was really bizarre. But it was, what was interesting was the old people would just look at you and there was that, yeah. you didn't have to talk. 
and, and they'd see your show and they'd come up and just hug you and leave it at that. It was just, it was just amazing, amazing. You know, there were these poignant moments, there was laughter, there was fun. Um, but I think underneath what we all tried to remember was our responsibility. Because even though you're overseas and you're, and you're doing all, and you're thinking you, you know, this hoi polloi, and you do get carried away with it sometimes. I, I don't understand how people want to gain fame and all this sort of stuff because it, it, it can stuff you up if you haven't got that grounding. Yeah. Um, and we have that grounding. And it was a responsibility back to our own people, our own families, that when we're overseas, we're not just being Raymond or, you know, Marilyn or whoever. We were actually being our forefathers and our families and our, not just the organisation or the company, you know, that all of this responsibility was with us all the time. So did it ever come, come across where the language barrier became a problem or yeah. funny or get yourself... Funny, up? yeah, absolutely funny, <laughs> but never a problem. Right. Never a problem. You'd always work it out, you know. Yeah. Uh, when we flew to South America, I slept with the Spanish cassettes stuck in my ear, so I had a bit of a feeling of Spanish when, when I got there. And then all the dancers going, tell this one that, tell that. It's like, guys, here's my cassette, just go away. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, yeah, there was a lot of that. Mm. And did you get to dance with other cultures as well? Uh, on our last tour, which was really interesting, we ended up in Israel. Um, it was for their 50th anniversary of the Israeli state or something or other. We didn't know this because by this time, 98, 99, whatever it was, we were becoming a lot more um, aware of the political situation globally and our place within that. So we'd had, you know, eight, nine years of, yeah, this is great fun and, you know, we're doing this and we're loving this. And along the way, we learnt about other people. And when we get to Israel, it's like, okay. <laughs> Um, we were with a whole group of people from Europe who had come together and, and to celebrate, I guess, which we tried to do. Um, they gave us the Australian flag to march with whenever we had to march and we put it aside and we marched with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, which was incredible because everybody that was there would look at the flags and go, Australia. Mm. And it was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't have to have the stars and stripes or whatever, it, what, you know, the stars yeah. and the, the Union Jack. They knew us by our flags, Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander flags. Um, it was just after that bridge had collapsed right. with all the Australians that had um, gotten killed over there. So they knew about Australia and us. And then it was a fabulous moment where they'd built this structure and all the nations had to march up the structure and Australia being A was at the beginning. And the dancers marched in and they went, we're not going up there. <laughs> and they were, they were like, why not? You have to go, Australia, A, up the top. And they were like, nope, your bridges collapse. We're staying on the ground. <laughs> and it was, we don't trust you. <laughs> you don't know how to build things. <laughs> it was so funny. It was so, because you'd see all of the, you know, all the Albania, blah, 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 all the way down the structure. And there's Australia sat down at the bottom. <laughs> We're not, we're not going up there. We're not moving. We start with Z now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, that was a really interesting thing too, because as they bust us around Israel, you'd go with three different countries in, in your buses and you'd go and dance at you know, Haifa and then you'd go and dance in Jerusalem and then you'd go and dance by the Dead Sea or something. So you'd go to all these places with these different countries and by the end of it, everyone was wanting to go with Australia because we were having fun. We were having a great time and singing in the bus and you know, talking and sharing stuff. And so someone else would get up and sing a German song and someone else would get up and sing, you know? So it was really, 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 really... Um, interactive. That's it. <laughs> interactive, yeah. sort of inspiring tour. Cross-cultural interaction. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, that very was, nice. And that was a nice way to round the company off. And after that tour, after Israel, we went, then went to London and Germany and then we came back and then I just left and voila. Voila. And what was your link to the Sydney Olympics? <laughs> were, I saw that you were the head of... Well, no, I was part... At that time, I'd been working with Marugeku Company and we did um, re-restaged Mimi 
the um, piece on stilts. And the Olympic Committee had seen the production, or someone from had seen the production, thought Olympic opening ceremony, blah, blah, blah. And um, so Rachel Swain, who was, is the director of the company, and I, being the choreographer at that time with the company, went into negotiations with them and they were going to fly all these mimis across the top of the stadium, which ended up being swimmers. Um, yeah, I think it became too much of a thing, a political bat for them, a ball for them to bat with, or you know what I'm saying. It got very political and we pulled out at the last minute. Um, but yeah, they, they kept for the, um, whatever, what's that? The, um, the guy, that, that, the big painting that went up with the, from the Kimberleys and they had still walkers on that. Oh, okay, good. Um, so they incorporated it, but... They incorporated some, yeah. but in a different way. Yeah. And it was Stalker Theatre Company, not Marugeku Company. Yeah. yeah, which is fine, you know. And, um, you know, the funny thing was we'd signed a waiver saying we wouldn't talk about what was happening in the opening ceremony. And as soon as we were out of the negotiations, I was telling everyone that Kathy Freeman was going to light the flame. <laughs> You're naughty. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Did you know Kathy Freeman's going to light the flame? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it didn't get on national news before it got out, so... There you go. <laughs> everyone that you told was quiet. <laughs> yeah, they were. Actually, at the time of the Olympic opening ceremony, I was in New Caledonia. Um, working on another opening ceremony, which was quite interesting as well. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it was good fun. So how's your French? French is good when I'm in France. Ah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, I think, thinking it. Because I'm in Australia, I think Australian or English. So I, um, I speak English and I think in... But when I'm in France or in Europe, I tend to think in a different language. It's, it's weird. That's cool. And, and it just... Flows. I, 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 I love it. That's cool. Yeah, but I can't speak my mother tongue. Oh. You pronounce it well? Sorry? You pronounce all the names of places and names of things that you were talking about before. I have to. Correctly, yeah. I have to because that's the only connection I have with that. Right. You'll hear old people saying, if you don't have your language, you've got nothing. Yeah. And I feel that's what I need, you know. And a bit guilty about that. A little bit, you know, it's like... Whenever I'm on a, on a community or on the islands, I, I try and get as much as I can. Yeah. They make fun of you, but, <laughs> you know, I'm still struggling and, and I accept that, you know, that's a condition of colonisation. Right. And, and, and I will continue that for the rest of my life. What was your connection to the Sydney Symphony Orchestra? That was part of the Olympic festivals. Right. Uh, Rhoda Roberts, who was directing the first Festival of the Dreaming, there were those four festivals that led up to the Olympics in 2000. The first one was the Festival of the Dreaming and Rhoda's, I guess, brief or desire was to see a lot of Aboriginal companies and a lot of Aboriginal performers go into the mainstream and, and infect our messages through their mediums. So you had people like... Um, uh, Sydney Theatre Company staging an all Aboriginal production of a Shakespeare play, you know. And so she came to me and she said, AIDT, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I've always loved classical music. And so she introduced me to Mary Valentine at the um, uh, Sydney Symphony Orchestra <laughs> at that time. She was there and um, they said, who's your favourite Australian choreographer? And I said, Peter Sculthorpe. And, I saw that you weren't Yeah, that. and Peter all of a sudden was there oh. and he was like, oh my God, you know. It's quite magical. <laughs> yeah, it was quite magical and we met and, and we discussed which one would be appropriate, which pieces of his would be appropriate to, to use for this. And so we did. We did uh, three nights in the um, concert hall with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra doing Peter Skulltop work. Wow. It was, see, I haven't even thought about that since, yes. and, I, and I'm thinking, wow, yeah, we did that. <laughs> I remember my family sitting with the VIPs and they were all standing and whistling and screaming and yeah, like, you know, blackfellas do in an audience and everyone else is sitting there going like this. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> it was fun. Right at the back guy. It was so fun. That's hilarious. Yeah. How important is it to express yourself through dance? For me, it, it's 
I need to be physical. Um, I was a sporty kind of kid, played footy, played basketball, did running, did swimming, just the background that you grew up with. Moved into dance, dance classes every day, nine to five, for you know, 25, 30 years. Um, and then your body starts to go, Arr. so I started going to the gym and Pilates and yoga and just to keep the physical because it's just, I guess for me, if I wasn't physical, as you can tell, the hands, you know, be Italian, it might be my Spanish. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's like breathing. Yeah. You know, if I'm not dancing or creating something physical, I'm a very touchy-feely person too. People just say, get off. <laughs> um, it's, it, nothing makes sense to me. Right. You know, it, it, I feel it here. And, and, and it needs to come out. Right. And if you don't let it out, you're going to rot. Right. Um, I, I always say, like, there's this choreographer, Graham Watson, um, who used to tell me, you spend your early years getting rid of all the crap that you put in your life. Yeah. And once you get to a stage, you'll start to actually reveal the true art of your life. And this is what we all aim at. And it's, you know, revealing the onion and all that sort of shit. But... Um, it's so true. It really is true. I look at my early works of choreography and at the time they were groundbreaking. Now I go, I sometimes cringe and go, where the heck did that come from? You know, and you do, you find your work becomes much more pure and you don't have to do so many tricks to have to actually say something direct. You know? So your own dance has evolved. My, yeah, absolutely. Last 30 years. I'd be really scared if it hasn't. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what. That's why. I, yeah, I love the classics. You know, you know, Sleeping Beauty and all those ballet things. Because, well, I look at traditional Aboriginal dance as similar as to classical ballet. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a form that needs. You need to train and train and train. And it's not just the physical training; it's the mental and spiritual training that gets you into that. And if you, if your spirit is being continually held back by all of these other barriers that you're putting in front just to survive, then the art form's going to die. It's going to just wither away and implode. How does dance connect you to your land and your heritage? <laughs> I've never, ever, ever been asked this question. How does it connect me? How does it connect me? I guess it's... Do you feel like the history comes through you when you're dancing? Do you feel like you're expressing your ancestors, things like that? My grandfather danced for the troops. Right. He was part of the First World War, I think it was. Okay. I don't know, one of the wars. Um, yeah, because I'm only 12. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I know, I'm 25. Um, <laughs> Who's been dancing for 25 years? Yeah, there you you're go. amazing. <laughs> um, my, he, my grandfather used to dance. He was in the army and he danced and he actually ended up in London dancing for the Queen. So, yeah, and this is a part of my history that I only learnt in the late, later years of my dance career. It was like, someone sent me a photo of him in London with the Queen. And I'm like, this looks like my grandfather. <laughs> like, yeah, hello, this is, you know, Victor Blanco, blah, 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 dancing. And it was like, far out. I was going to say that. That's before, very good recovery. <laughs> And he, so that's your connection. That's then, my connection. You? But when I dance, and I, it it, it, it connects through your feet, <laughs> through my spirit. Yeah. It's through, yeah, yeah. You say, but it, that is, you, you're right. It is through your feet. You connect to the earth. You connect. You know. I believe that we're all made of the same thing. I'm one of those believers that you know all of our particles and cells and shit and it's all the same as the trees and the wind and the grass and the earth and we need to wake that up and and really connect that's the connection that's and if you really feel that that feeds your spirit and if you're on the right path you will know because something will push you towards the right path otherwise it's just you you can't ignore that's why I say, you cannot ignore you try and fight it and you'll lose. Reconnecting with your heritage is so important. It, is, it helps solidify you. 
Um, you know, here I, at the moment I teach Aboriginal studies here for the younger, the first years that come through it's because we get so many different uh, backgrounds of people that some have like found out in the last three years that they're Aboriginal and, you know, others come from a remote community or people have grown up with the culture. So you're getting all of this, you're getting white skinned blackfellas, you know, who are really paranoid about, oh, I, um, stolen generation, you know, what? and so you're trying to give them this sense of belonging and ownership of their culture. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's a difficult thing for them to do. And if that, and the, there are more and more and more people discovering this. And the more we can actually allow them to accept, you know, yeah, you've got Aboriginal, but you've also got your Irish and you've also got that, and that makes you who you are, you know. If you identify as Aboriginal, we can help you further. You know, um, I always identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander with Spanish and Malay background. You know, that's part of who I am. Yeah. You know, that's part of who they are. If they, if, you know, whatever, whatever that their heritage is, it's, yeah. it's all part of that fruit salad we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you help Indigenous kids now who are trying to find their path or through creativity. It is through dance and it is through creativity and it's about finding the words, the language now that relate to that part of them. You know, when I said I teach Aboriginal studies, they leave the room crying sometimes because I've got to make that connection. I've got to make them aware of that connection. And even if it's hard for them to go there, they have to go there because the art is not real unless it's, it, it comes from there. If it doesn't come from there, you're bullshit. Yeah. You know, and it's and being human beings, we can see. You don't have to be black. You can feel it from what from white, Chinese, whatever. If you know someone's not coming from that place, it's a lie. You may as well just, you know. Well, it shows too, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Inauthentic kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Yeah. How can we support young indigenous people to get involved in dance, art and culture? I feel the best way is for us to help wider, not whiter, wider Australia. Because yeah. there's some black fellas too that need to accept it. Right. Is accept the history that has happened in this. Because uh, we, we haven't. Right. Pockets of it have. A lot of pockets won't acknowledge it. They won't accept it. That's the way. And I guess, yeah, it, it, it is through education, but I'd like us to go beyond that. I, I want a new consciousness and a new awareness of how to do this, because it's proven that education and books and all the shit that society has been built on doesn't work. Right. There's too many loops that people can get through. So you're thinking it's more through experience? Yeah, it's experience. Yes, it is experience. Mm. Experience. Like connection as in? Yeah, connect, connect, connect with yourself. Connect with your truth, your heritage. Yeah, you might have been, your, your grandparents may have come here many years ago, so yes, you're Australian, yes, you're part of this land. We'll accept the fact that they had to come here. We accept the fact that we were here, but we had to come from somewhere, you know? We may have been the first sailors to come across the waters to get here, or that earth, bridge was already there you know so you know we all came from somewhere we've got to accept the truth of our histories yeah. and and connect with that be honest with yourself yeah. you know if you're not honest with this you know you can't look yourself in the mirror in the morning yeah. if you can look at yourself in the mirror and accept and believe that you are doing the best you can with whatever you believe you have at that point in time great but tomorrow get up and do better ah nice one <laughs> Is that what you tell your students? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, that's what. Oh, stretching, stretching, teaching them to stretch. Yeah, yeah, I can stretch. I can do this, and then you go over and you push them that much more, and then oh my god, that's painful. Yeah, so you're comfortable. Don't ever get comfortable. Don't ever get comfortable. There's always more to learn. Always more to go for. And what's more for you? What's coming up for you? Oh, the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm probably sitting behind a desk, but the true, I, I, haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. 
you know, yeah, okay, I've been in the business 35 years, whatever. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. I can feel something coming. Good. And I know that I'm on the right path to get there. Yeah. But it's, it's about... It's about taking what the kids now believe is their form of communication and, and pulling it right back, stripping it that right back. And that's, there's a key. Because, yeah, okay, it's all techni technology and shit like that at the moment. And that's good to a certain point, but there needs, and they haven't made that connection yet. And that's, once they make that connection, and that's what I'm going to be a part of, right. is making them to help that connection happen. And it's going to come through the work that I do next year. Great. <laughs> well, we look forward to hearing more. Oh, yeah. Google me. <laughs> I had to throw it in. <laughs>